heard them. Don't worry. All right. It is the top that of the hour, is, uh, and we're going to get started. <laughs> Have fun, you guys. Thank you. It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons. Welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz. I am Landon Mance. Typically, uh, I am co-host number two. Uh, behind co-host number one, Austin Peterson, but he is uh, dabbling his toes in the sand right now in Maui with his family, so he will not be joining us, but luckily we've got a met much better looking, um, more follically inclined uh, gentleman by the name of Ryan Weissmuller, who's going to be my co-host today. Uh, Ryan is a big uh, advocate of the show, a great uh, strategic partner to Austin, myself, and, and a lot of our uh, clients and listeners. So uh, we are happy to have Ryan joining us as co-host, uh, but we are even more excited to have Matt Altman joining us. He is the co-founder and the current CEO of Sportique, which is a, a global uh, lifestyle and apparel brand. Matt, uh, thank you for joining us today. Really excited to have you here. Thanks, Landon. Really excited to be here and I uh, really appreciate uh, the time to talk about uh, the business. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. So Matt, uh, usually before we get into any business talk, uh, if you're okay with it, love to have you just take a couple minutes. Uh, tell us about you uh, personally. Tell us about your family, things that you like to do outside of business and just kind of lead us up to uh, how you got to where you are today. Sure. So um, born and raised in Arizona. So I'm a true Phoenician and then went to the University of Arizona, uh, got my degree in accounting and um, definitely realized very early on after graduating that uh, accounting was not uh, my path. And I was quite fortunate through some internships or during college in developing some relationships that I was able to uh, get a job in professional sports and work for the Phoenix Suns and Arizona Diamondbacks and had a 12-year career there as the director of merchandise. So really kind of cut my teeth in merchandising and business um, in that space and, and really learning everything from, from sales to operations to merchandising, retail, inventory, all those uh, fun things. And really wanted to embrace my entrepreneurial spirit. And um, fortunately, my business partner, Jason Franklin, was in the similar space in his career, and we came together and started Sport Sportique, where we both really saw a niche in the marketplace uh, at the time to deliver better lifestyle apparel to what I'll call the destination retail space. So if you think back to 2005, 2006, the space was uh, very uh, vanilla in terms of the apparel offering, heavyweight, boxy t-shirts, um, slap a just heavyweight logo um, print uh, and, and that was really kind of it and so um, we really ha saw a displaced consumer someone that might be shopping at a Bloomingdale's or Nordstrom's or a boutique who um, understands quality understands you know design and, and, and has no problem paying for quality so to speak and so really um, we took uh, boutique inspired trends in terms of fit, fashion, feel, and, and decoration and fused it with classic sportswear, hence the name Sportique. Um, personally, you know, I uh, love sports, have always loved sports, playing sports. Most recently, though, just uh, for the first time being a native, I hiked down the Grand Canyon this past weekend, so I'm actually a little sore. Um, but uh, yeah, and I uh, married to my wife, Clara, for the last 
um, almost 14 years this this month and have a of a daughter uh, as well. And uh, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Thanks for sharing that. Um, first question I have for you, which just uh, came to mind as you were uh, giving us a little bit of background on yourself. Uh, so you said that uh, you and your partner, uh, you said his name was Jason. Correct. Right. So you guys are co co-founders. Is that right? Correct. So talk to us just for a minute um, about, um, you know, how did that, how did that conversation come about, you know, to, to go off and start your own thing? And then also kind of maybe tell us, you know, what, what are the different roles, the hats that kind of each of you have, have worn in the past and maybe that you're, you know, currently wearing? Yeah. I mean, I, I, in terms of starting, I think it was just one of those, like, serendipitous kind of times in our in our life it was the right place right time from when we met um cultivated a friendship and a relationship to then hey what are we doing in it with our lives what are we doing in our careers hey here's let's start it let's start a business and um and really taking that leap of faith in trusting ourselves and trusting what we saw in the marketplace to to deliver um, a product in, into the space that we that we saw, uh, I you know my I think what's been very helpful is I, I think we kind of joke that we're yin, yin and yang, and I think that's um, really helpful in in having you know partnerships and and in this case you know uh, co-founders where uh, Jason really thrives in sales and marketing and business development. And um, I'm more operations, more operational, more strategic, um, financial uh, scenarios and th things of that nature. And so obviously when you start the business, it's all hands on deck. Um, I'm doing sales, he's doing sales. We're doing all sorts of things, um, packing boxes and, and whatnot to where now as the company has evolved, you know, uh, we have, you know, good roles and, and lines of how we operate. Matt, yeah. is there a is there a time you can point to where you you and Jason looked at each other and said, "Oh my gosh, we've got a real company now"? I think we're still I think we're still doing that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's a it's a good it's a good question because I think Jason and I have both have a similar mindset of growth and that um, we don't rest on our on, on our laurel, laurel so to speak. And so um, we celebrate these these wins, but then we keep moving we keep moving forward. So I think there's been little milestones along the way. Probably when we first hired someone, that was like the first thing. Wow, okay, this is real. And it, we we started the company in January of '06. Um, our first part time hire was uh, July of '07, and full time hire was November of '07. So I think when you make that commitment, and now you're responsible for payroll and other people's well-being and how that affects their livelihood then then it was like okay this is this is real so give us give a, you you just kind of shared with us your first hires and give us kind of just a, a general idea of what of what your team kind of looks like today so the team today we have a, a seven person exec team that consists of me and and Jason and then uh, we have an accounting team, um, which our director of accounting is on the exec team. Uh, marketing, a director of marketing, director of sales, director of operations, and a creative director. So our main teams are accounting, operations, sales, uh, sales marketing, and then creative. And that creative is a real important space because um, that's where the product development happens. It's where the graphic design happens. and. Um, you know, knock on wood, um, Jason and I have been really fortunate to have uh, basically five of the seven folks on the exec team have been with us pretty much since day one. Our creative director was with us when we first started, and the first two hires that I mentioned um, are still with are still um, with the company, and they're part of the exec team. Wow, very cool. Ryan, did you want to say something? Well, yeah. It was, what's the secret to, to keeping folks around? You, you don't hear that all the time. So what has been the secret to the longevity of some of the team with the company? I, you know, it's an interesting because I, I feel like it's almost a question you have to ask them. Um, and I've, but I've heard the question asked before. And I think it's really um, rooted in our culture. 
and rooted in our values and living and how those values get played out in, in building the, in building the culture. You know, I, I love, I love that. I love that point. And that was something uh, that I wanted to ask you about um, at some point in this conversation, I envisioned it being a little bit later in the conversation, but since you mentioned it, I, I feel like it's a lot more appropriate actually to ask it in the beginning, right? Because um, I would think that uh, you would attribute a lot of your, you know, the, the success of Sport Teak to the people that have helped you build, you know, the company from day one. And um, I, I truly do believe that um, that is why people stick, you know, with, uh, with a founder for so long is that uh, their, their, their values, you know, have to have some kind of alignment there, or it's never going to, you know, it's never going to last long term. So talk to us just a little bit, you know, about what, what does that look like? You know, what, what are, you know, the values of the company and how does that, how does that translate over to the employees and, and, you know, the long, long time retention of, of, it sounds like most or all of your, of your staff people. Yeah, so I think one way that might be helpful for me to describe this is actually going to the roots of the values. And then they really stem from fundamental human needs that we have as, as a human being. So, when I, and there's really three that I'll, that I'll talk about. The first one is that uh, we all as humans have this innate desire to be free. We want freedom, we wanna feel free. And we also have this want to be independent, right? That's a drive that we have on some, on some level, some more than others. But then we also have the same dependency and need for community, family, et cetera, right? So anything that you're gonna actually build and anything that you're gonna grow, you're gonna need help. You're gonna need other things that to, to help you move that, move those things along. And so how do we then take that understanding and bring that into the work environment where we're now spending most of our day, you know, at work, right? And so it really comes down to teamwork and, and then understanding what your role is on that team and how, how people can then show up and bring their unique gifts, talents, and strengths to, to the role and, and then plug that in as part of, as part of a team. So it's really about how can you um, balance allowing people to be themselves, letting them be themselves, giving them that freedom, but then also having the structure of community and family to, to stay together and connected. So that's the first one. Second one is uh, learning. So uh, for me, I, I've kind of really un come to understand this in a deep way that from the moment we're born to that very last breath, part of the experience of being on this planet is learning. We can't really escape it. Uh, we can embrace it or we can run from it. But I will tell you, in my experience, life can have painful ways of making us learn if we don't you know, look to embrace it. So I think this whole aspect of learning is just very human. And so now bringing it into the workspace, how do we bring that, that part in? So one of our values is evolve, to have a growth and learning mindset. How do we get better at being ourselves? How do we get better at our craft, at least by 1%, you know, every day? And then also part of growing, part of learning is making mistakes. So allowing that to be part of the process, that for us to, to grow, for us to play with edges, we have to take some risk and we have to be okay with those mistakes. But then we also have to learn from them and we have to evolve from that. If we keep making the same mistakes over and over, then there's really something wrong. Um, but I think that's, that's uh, so learning is, is a, I think a big core um, in terms of values. And then the, la the third one, which you can probably say is the most important one is fundamentally as a human being, we want to feel good. We want to be happy. Um, everything that we do in life ultimately is in search for that experience. So how can we bring that into part of our values? So, you know, one of our values is fun. Um, 
and really I I've said this before, like we're an apparel company. So we're not in the business of saving lives, so to speak. Right. And so how do we allow people to be themselves, be the best version of themselves, create a positive, um, you know, environment, um, and really have people, you know, having a good, you know, positive attitude, you know, day in and day out, knowing that we are human. So we are going to make mistakes. We are going to have our bad days, but how do we then uh, be a part of a team and be able to pick each other up um, through that whole process? Matt, so something very central is that there's a lot of intentionality behind the Sportique logo, the, the Buffalo. <laughs> Where did that come from? What What is the symbolism of that buffalo? And then how does that tie into the values that you just mentioned? Well, our creative director, Joel Haller, he presented that logo first. And when I saw it, I was so striking. Both Jason and I uh, really liked it. And for me, growing up, um, the buffalo always, uh, for me, was a symbol of courage. And so when I saw that and and understood what we were undertaking. Like it, it takes a lot of courage, I think, to, to start a business. Um, and then when you start understanding deeper, uh, you know, back when we started, our tagline was reinventing the classic. So really that was a source of clothing, you know, back in, back in the day. Um, but then the whole mentality of the Buffalo, the herd, um, they actually embrace that independence, but they also need the herd to to evolve right and then the one thing there's two things that i that i think are fascinating about um the uh buffalo one it could run at 60 miles an hour straight and turn on a dime literally so when we started the company i mean that was pivoting was so important uh for us you know I, it's funny jason and i um we were looking at original um, business plans. And so like, you know, that first business plan, like 30 days in was already ripped up and you're off to, you know, to something different. <laughs> and then the other interesting aspect around the, the Buffalo, which, which was, I you know, brought this up during, during COVID is that um, the Buffalo actually runs into the storm versus all the other animals run away from the storm. And the, the, their thinking, the thinking behind that is they running into the storm, they'll get through it quicker mm -hmm. um, versus running away from it and then having to deal with it once it, you know, it gets to you. Interesting. Well, you, you, you teed up uh, our next uh, part of this conversation so nicely because you talked about embracing learning and uh, uh, running into the storm and having to, you know, be uh, having to adapt and, you know, pivot and change. And, you know, that's uh, the reason that we're sitting here today is because uh, Ryan, uh, you know, suggested that we have you come on the show and just said that you've got a really great story about, um, you know, how you have had to pivot this last, call it, you know, 12 to uh, 15 months through, through COVID. So um, maybe just, just as a, as a lead into that, uh, kind of talk to us just for a minute about where the business was, you know, call it third quarter, or I'm sorry, fourth quarter, 2019, first quarter, 2020 coming into COVID. And then uh, talk to us about, you know, where, uh, you you ran into some major uh, roadblocks. You were running straight into the storm, and then uh, you know how you kind of pivoted. So love love to uh, to hear uh, how you guys uh, uh, approach that. Sure. So I'll go to fourth quarter of 2019 to start. So uh, we made a decision in early 2019 to a very very important business decision where we took uh, two um, third party um, outsourced entities of the company that we had been utilizing for years. And we um, really put those two together and we started our own production facility to provide um, decoration uh, embellishment solutions, warehousing, fulfillment uh, and whatnot for the company. So it was a really big undertaking 
in the fourth quarter where we started building out a production facility. So we're talking about um, investment in equipment, in space, in warehousing. And so it was a real long-term investment that we were looking at as the company was hit some milestones in terms of growth, in terms of revenue. And so it really became a very um, logical next step for the company to, to, t- to take. So January, February of 2020, we were, uh, January, we started having about 25, 30% of our orders now running through this facility. February was 50%. And the whole goal was at the end of March, 100% of our orders would be now running through this facility. We'd have it fully staffed, operational, and start, you know, working out our kinks uh, in preparation for our peak season, which really runs September to December. So we're in the midst of building, 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 you know, this up. And then um, March 11th, I'll never, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget where I was. I was sitting on my couch um, watching, um, about to watch an NBA game. I should also reference that um, Sportique's first client in 2006 was the NBA. And uh, we're a licensee of the NBA and have been, you know, since the inception of the company. So the NBA has been a, you know, a near and dear to my heart and it's been a, a big part of our business. So I'm getting ready to watch a game and it gets canceled. Uh, Rudy Gobert was tested with um, COVID and uh, they canceled the game. And subsequent to that, to that, other games got canceled to when the, then the league announced that they're going to take a 30-day hiatus and see how everything starts to, to play out. So me seeing that, I freaked out um, in, a, in, a, in a, not a crazy way, but it was just, I was a big alarm bell because I was a big domino to fall. Um, me understanding how the NBA works to, to actually stop and, and really do that. It was a real serious, serious thing. Um, next day, went into the office and really started uh, looking at cash flow. And okay, what does the company look like over the next 30, 60, 90 days with maybe no revenue coming in? Just take worst case scenario. And from that worst case scenario, start looking at, okay, what do we need to do? How are we gonna get, gonna get through this? And so really quickly um, got defensive where we were strategically offensive. I think as a CEO, um, I like to play, if you if you look at the soccer field, I like to be, you know, mid point and looking to score versus, you know, playing defense. So I completely went all the way back to the goalie net and started playing goalie even uh, in some aspects in looking at how to navigate and make some next decisions. So. Um, first thing was just, uh, reserving cash or injecting cash where we could, um, cut expenses. We had to, um, reduce our staff, uh, negotiate with vendors and supply chain partners on, on payables, um, and really went into this complete defensive, uh, of mode, um, Matt, you mentioned, so obviously in your case, there was a a day that the world changed, but the dominoes fell very quickly. For you as a CEO, your decision-making process in the face of just complete uncertainty, how did you get your mind around, you're playing defense, but how did you get your mind around the next moves? What was the process that you went through, literally not knowing what domino was going to fall the next day? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to defense. I I like I think the first thing I went to chess. I like playing. I used to play chess a lot when I was a kid, and so um, forever for anyone who's gonna play me in chess, I'll give you one of my secrets: is I get defensive first, and then I just go hyper offensive. So I put something in place to protect my you know my king, and I feel pretty good about it. And then I just you know I'll I'll I'll. I'll play offense. And that was the, that was the kind of mode. Okay. Protect, protect the King. We got to protect the company um, at all costs um, pretty much because um, seeing what was happening in the world kind of quickly kind of forecasting what, what this could look like. I mean, again, this is before any knowing anything around a PPP or anything of, of that nature. It was like, okay, we need to 
protect the house, make sure that we're, we can get through this as best as possible. Because the other aspect um, that I didn't mention is we're, we're, we're ramping up the business. So we're receiving inventory in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, so now we've got, you know, capital tied up in building this production facility inventory uh, where we start seeing sales pick up in April, May, June, we're now, all of our resources are, are pretty tied up, so to speak. Right. And so um, it was just, but I also needed to remain positive. I needed to remain, um, you know, keep my head above the water, so to speak, to be able to, to navigate as best as, as best as possible. Relied on a lot of um, people to just talk and what were they seeing? What were they experiencing? Um, talking to mentors, talking to other business owners uh, was really helpful to kind of understand um, what are they seeing, what are they doing, and how best to react. Yeah. I mean, my initial reaction, right? So, so you share with us that right as COVID, um, you know, just demolishes the economy in, in March of 2020, you know, you, you took on this huge, I, I assume it for your company, you know, huge project of bringing all of that, you know, in-house and pretty, I'm sure, very capital intensive. And like you said, it kind of tied up some resources for, for a short period of time. So my, my initial reaction is, to, you know, to say, oh man, you know, what, what, how unfortunate, what, what bad timing, but for someone like yourself, I, I would envision, you know, you, you seem like a really positive person that can really embrace something like that and say, okay, look, let's, yes, we've got some challenges that we need to face. Let's go on defense here so that we can, we can kind of take a step back and, and just absorb everything that's happening. But also, like you mentioned, waiting strategically waiting for that opportunity for you to flip the switch and say, okay, it's, it's now time to go back, back on the offense. So having that, that, that mindset, I mean, um, would you attribute the success that you have had coming out of COVID to really having that, that mindset that you had in the, in the beginning phases of it? I mean, I would, I would, one aspect of it, yes, right. And I feel like I've I've always had this um, growth mindset, this learning mindset, looking at things that happen from an opportunistic point of view. Um, when things happen to me, or or scenarios happen in life, the first question I always ask, you know, what am I to learn from this? You know, what am what is the thing that I? What's the takeaway, right? So there was a ton of takeaways that were happening in the moment around around COVID. And then, um, so it was, it was really kind of, I guess, really making sure from we, the, the, our house was in order, so to speak. And, and again, we really went into survival mode and I really had to turn off all the other initiatives, had to throw away literally that day, all the goals that we had for the year, all the plans, everything. And I think that's another thing too, is you, if, if, you already see a different future to be able to just be comfortable and throw that all, all away. Cause it's not reality anymore. You're dealing with something different. And so from that space started creating from what was real in that moment. And so that was getting defensive. So we can then see where are the opportunities for us to be offensive again, cause they will arise, they will show up, but we're never going to, be able to see that materialize if we don't survive. So survival was just the number one goal and just putting that hat on that, having that mindset instead of, you know, anything else. Yeah, absolutely. So not, not saying that we are out of this mess by uh, any stretch because, because we are not, but uh, it does appear that there is light at the end of the tunnel and hopefully, um, that is going to be upon us much, much sooner rather than later. Uh, but Matt, share with us, what would you say are maybe two or three of the biggest lessons, you know, that, uh, that you and the company have, you know, learned uh, through COVID the last, you know, 12-ish months? 
Well, I'll give um, business one, and then I'll give uh, a personal, more of a personal one. So professionally, I think it was uh, really relying um, on values to help get through this scenario. So um, in good times and bad, how to look at your values to um, address what's happening. So one of our values is having a can-do attitude. It's can-do. So um, early on in, in, in April when everything was, was happening, we looked at that value and like, okay, what, what can we do, right? And, and one of the things that we, we started saying is we can be mindful. Um, we can stay connected to each other because obviously everything went, went virtual. Um, we can help. We can give back in some shape or shape, some shape or form, and we can make cool, comfortable clothes. We know we can we can do that, and so it really um, then sparked us to create a together we win T-shirt that we sold on our site, uh, where all the proceeds went to um, help with frontline healthcare relief around COVID, and I think that helped us um, feel normal. It helped us do something from a business standpoint, but it also helped us just help people and, and really kind of come together around this whole, um, slogan together we win, which I feel is, is, you know, was impactful and is still true today. Um, and, and then also just pivoting, you know, we pivoted to face covers. We, you know, and, and I think the other, the other lesson was even in, really, really tough times is to um, stick with good business practices. Um, so forecasting, planning, budgeting um, as best as you can, even if it's from one day to the next day, and then getting from two days to four to eight, right? So I think, um, you know, th those things were important. And so instead of looking at a bigger picture, you're just, you know, shortening your, your window. And then personally, um, you know, Ryan knows me, so um, I'll, I'll go a little deep on this uh, for one second is, it's just the fact that I was alive, mm -hmm. that um, I've always had a, um, a keen notion around life and being alive. And so when everything was happening, I really doubled down on existence and being alive that in the midst of what was happening in terms of you can call it craziness, chaos. I'm alive, and that's a pretty darn miraculous, cool thing. And so, how do I embrace my existence through through this? Right. Um, so that was probably you know the other lesson. I, I love the focus on normalcy <laughs> and 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 almost simplicity, right? And and those were those those core cornerstone pieces that got you through it. You, you talked about your own your own growth and, and using it as a learning experience for you and that obviously being one of the core values of the company. Certainly the team had a lot of growth through this process as well. Are there things that you can take away that hopefully we don't have a COVID scenario again, but the team keeps growing in similar veins? What have you learned from this experience that might help your team continue to grow? Yeah, I mean, I think sticking together. You know, sticking together, um, communicating, um, planning, just again, just, uh, and, and then being okay with changing plans if they don't work out um, and being more quicker to some of those decisions, being more decisive, um, not, in, not only individually, but collectively as a, as a team. Uh, I think we made some, naturally, there were some good pivots that came out in terms of how we look at sales now um, a bit differently than we did before. The one thing I'll say during COVID, um, you know, we kept the sales team intact and, and really the, the, our intention was not about generating sales and it was really about being relational to our clients. And really that was really the focus is just being there for them. Um, so, uh, someone to talk to, someone to communicate, someone to just connect with, because we are all were working from home. So just even it was just checking in and seeing how someone was doing. So really being relational, um, not transactional. And if there were opportunities for transactions, you know, great. Um, there'd be a time and place, you know, for that. And we're seeing that, you know, today. Yeah. So. Matt, if you would, um, I'd love to just have you talk for a couple minutes on um, 
this uh, situation of being, you know, uh, facing COVID and all of the um, all the issues that were presented to to Sportique, um, having to make all of the changes that you have alluded uh, to in our conversation so far, but then coming into posting, uh, I believe a, a record fourth quarter for your company. So just talk to us about that. How did that, how did that happen? Yeah. So the first thing I'll tell you is if you, when I first started telling this story is we had inventory. So I think a lot of companies might've had some supply chain challenges. So I think that was one of the things early on, it was like, Hey, good news is we have inventory. Bad news is we have inventory. Um, so we were prepared from that, from that sense. And because things became, things came hot and heavy, uh, big time. And so what's interesting is we, um, had our best quarter as a company ever with half our clients. So we were working with, um, you know, clients who were doing very well during COVID. Um, one in particular was Trek Bicycle. So they're an outdoor company. And so they, they were doing very well. And then the companies that we were uh, also doing well with had an e-commerce component to their business. So Sportique's um, website, it's our web business, really peaked and, and grew a lot during covid um, and then our, some of our key accounts, their business was growing a lot online. So uh, we saw more volume in, in orders. Um, and so uh, that really was you know, helpful. And again, having the production facility, um, you know, that was also a, a big help too. So where at the beginning of COVID, it felt like, oh my God, this, this could be the thing that brings us down. It was also one of the things that helped us get out of it. Yeah, interesting. So um, clearly, you were presented with some some issues. You seem to work through those pretty uh, effectively. Um, but looking back, Matt, you know what? What's maybe just one or two things that you you think that you could have done differently? Wow, it's a it's a good question, and I I don't know because. I feel like we did a lot of good things. You know, we had to make other, even in, in the, even in the fact that we had inventory, we had to make some inventory decisions to have in the fourth quarter. And we did so, and um, it, it paid off. And then in the same sense, we didn't have enough in, in we actually could have done better than, than we did. Um, I think that the thing for me, never having gone through something like something like this. And I will say personally, it was the most challenging year of my life was personal, the, how to handle some conversations with employees or other personnel around, around this. Um, there was hard conversations to have, and, and I maybe could have handled some of those better that would have helped that person or helped some other things uh, along. But I feel like I did the best I could give in with, you know, the scenario that we were, where we were in. So, so Matt, you mentioned, you know, a situation like Trek, you mentioned your sales team out there just being as relational as they possibly could. You know, this is a, this is a success story too of the, of the little guy taking on the big guys, because you've, you've taken business away from large competition at, at a very challenging time in the marketplace where a lot of, a lot of little guys were at risk of not making it. What, what was the secret to that and, and what maybe inspiration might you provide for some of the up and coming tycoons out there that, that they can take and, and learn from it? Yeah. So I don't want to name names. I don't want to piss those big competitors <laughs> off because, you know, things are starting to come back now, but I think because we were small and nimble um, and that we were, uh, again, I think we, we stayed connected to clients and I think that means a lot to those clients. Um, I think, uh, again, I think it comes down to something very human, which is courage, you know, really being courageous through all of this, even though you've got to deal with some, with some challenging things. Um, I think you need to surround yourself with good people. You need to have a good team. And, and thankfully, the sport team, sport team is just amazing. 
um, from how we handled cash flow management, which I think was super important to get through that. I can't under, I can't overestimate or underestimate, however you want to look at that, um, how important managing cash flow and having visibility and understanding um, what you know, how that, how that is handled for your business. Cause that it's so impactful. And I don't think people, you know, you know, see it, you know, people don't really even talk about it. So I think proper cash flow management, but then just um, keeping the core team together was really important and having people that were dedicated to the business in multiple ways, whether it was pitching in in sales, pitching in, in marketing, um, in, wearing many different hats, which is, which is what we all had to, had to do. Um, so in some sense, because Jason and I were the founders and started the company, we were able to kind of draw back from some of those early days and how we worked and how we got through things to um, help coach, you know, everyone else, you know, through it. And then there were, again, we've had the exec team together for a long time. So um, they were able to, you know, um, go back to and rely on some of those, that energy as well. So some great lessons getting back to the entrepreneurial roots and, and flexing some of those muscles that you probably, probably weren't looking forward to flexing, uh, yeah. you know, again, taking it, taking it one step further. And I love the analogy of, of the soccer field and playing offense versus defense and, and moving on the field. What would you suggest at the end of the day, you and Jason had to make some hard decisions. You had to decide when we were going to, how far up the field we were going to move, and then we're going to pull back a little bit. What, what might you suggest to someone who's, who's stuck in that same quandary of, of not know, okay, is it safe to go play offense now? Do I need to play more defense? What, what, were the, what were the guiding points for you to know where on the field you should be at a point in time? Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind for me around this. So I think the first thing I'm just going to say is, you know, the goal in business is, is to grow, is to generate revenue and, and, and yield a profit, you know, from that. So if you take the soccer field analogy, the goal is to score. So you've got, you know, so I think the thing is, is you, but you also don't want to get scored on. Right. So I think in this, in this scenario that we're talking about, uh, we definitely didn't want to get scored on. So we had to get very defensive and make sure that we were protected in a way so we can now start slowly moving the ball up the field to try and, to try and score. So I think um, there's a balance in all of this. And, uh, and I think that <laughs> I've, we've talked about it, feel. Having a certain feel of where you are on the field in time and space, knowing when that you have to retreat and then when you need to, you see a, a window open or a door open and you now need to you know, push forward. And I think that's the key is when those doors open, you got to push forward. Um, you can't be stagnant. You got to, you got to move. And um, it takes more than one person. One person might, you know, lead through the door and to make, maybe one day it's me and the next day it's Jason. The next day it's, you know, someone in sales or operations, but that we're all looking to keep moving forward in some shape or form. Um, and that's, that's all part of teamwork, right? You know, Matt, one of my one of my favorite things about uh, co-hosting this show with with Austin today, Ryan, of course, is that um, well, I love getting to know people. First of all, I'm a people person. Second, though, is I, I love hearing people's stories, but also learning from their experiences. And one of the conversations that I have a lot with with my business owner clients and. Um, Austin and I, our primary focus is on serving private business owners. Uh, one of the conversations that I have a lot is, is around uh, values. Uh, a lot of the businesses that we serve are in that five to 50 million of revenue space. Um, a lot of them are, are really uh, focused on, on growth as you are, but they, they get to this point where they're just kind of stuck. You know, they don't really know how to move forward so they got to bring in uh people like ryan to, to help them create you know strategic plan for for growth and the other stuff that he does but when my clients have asked me you know what why do we need to talk about you know values like we we've never had that discussion we've gotten where we are today why do we need to talk about that and my answer has always just kind of been vague matt just 
Well, it's important that the people that are working for you and that look up, do you have similar values so that you guys are kind of in alignment as you try to move forward. But now I have this totally different answer that I can provide. And I'm going to reference exactly what you have said today, because, you know, hiring and firing, you know, people based on the values of the company, that seems like that has had such a huge part of your success coming through COVID because the values that are instilled in in the in in you and your executive team and the people that you work that that work for you guys, they are in alignment. And by having them in alignment, it has allowed you to to not only survive but to thrive. You know, coming out of this. Whereas if they weren't, uh, you may not you know be sitting where you are today having this conversation with us. So. That is my biggest takeaway is, is just, is being able to apply uh, how Im the importance of values when it comes to a, a company's success. So thank you for that. And yeah, go ahead and jump in. Yeah. So it's, it's more than the values. It's really, it's really about the culture, right? So the values help you help provide a guideline and a frame of reference to build the culture that you want to build. And that's really what you want. You want to get the culture right. You want to um, have people that are, are um, fit that culture um, that, that can bring you their unique gifts, talents, and strengths and, and align with the culture and the values. The values is, is, is really helps drive behaviors, choices. It's a frame of reference, but it's all about the culture. So um, for it, for those listening, you know, one early on, you know, one of the things that I heard um, that was told to me was get the culture right. You get the culture right, then everything else can kind of fall into place. It doesn't matter, you know, if you can have the greatest product, this, that, and the other, and you can have, you know, the sales, but you're not going to be able to grow the business sustainably um, in a long-term standpoint if you don't have a, a good culture. So, to me, it's, it's that. So then when you look at what are the things that you need to build a good, healthy culture, then it's values. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like you've got the, the values that are, that are the, the, the foundation, but if you're not implementing, if you're not living and breathing and setting those examples, then they're, you know, they're irrelevant essentially. Right. So Matt, um, Great conversation. This has been phenomenal. Um, talk to us for a couple minutes. You know, what, what does the future look like for Sportique? You know, what are your guys' plans? Where, where do you go moving forward? Well, I feel like we're, we're not out of it yet. We're, we're close um, to, to really, um, and I think this first quarter, April, really having a full 12, 13 months of dealing with, you know, uh, the COVID world, um, where I'll, where I'll feel a lot more comfortable, but I think, um, the future is online, um, not only for Sportique, but everyone, everywhere else. So that's either our, our own e-commerce business or the clients that we work with in their e-commerce, uh, business. Um, fortunately, you know, uh, Sportique is modern American comfort wear. It's hoodies, it's, uh, comfortable sweatpants, tees. And so what you're seeing now in, in the marketplace um, around this trend is, is right in our wheelhouse. So there's really great opportunity for the company to grow um, in our wholesale business and our um, direct to consumer business. Um, so really excited about the, the future and, and where the company can now w grow. I feel like we really went through one of the, the hardest things and um, coming out of it and dealing it with it the way we did. Um, I think there's a real bright future ahead for the company. Matt, what do you, you, you have an interesting perspective too, because of the different customers you are, you are touching and, and the wide swath. What, what do you take away from what's going on in the market right now? A lot of people are still asking the questions. Are, are we out of the woods? Is there still more pain to come? Are our customers out there buying or is there still some hesitation? Is the consumer buying what are you seeing globally just from your perch? Well, 
Well, first around Sportique, what's interesting is we're we're basically back to 2019 numbers for Q1. And we're again, we're still only dealing with half our clients. So the other half of our clients are not open yet. So that's events, it's it's tourist destination places, it's resorts, it's uh, concerts and things of that nature. So we see a, a big opportunity coming our way the second half of the year. But you've heard probably, you know, economists talk about pent up demand. I think it's real. I think it's very real. Um, I was literally on my way over here was listening to a podcast talking about um, the digital videos that the NBA is doing um, around instead of a card, you can actually buy a digital video and it's an asset and you can trade it or sell it. And um, people have, they they're having different ways of connecting with people and it's through these types of digital platforms, but they're spending money. It's another way that they're spending money, utilizing resources. Um, you heard, I was just, you know, at the, uh, I was at the Grand Canyon this past weekend. It was packed. There was a lot of people there and people want to start getting out. And I think there's, there's um, with PPP, with stimulus, with um, people not, um, traveling over the last 12 months. So there's been disposable income that's been saved and waiting to be, you know, unleashed, I think. And so um, I, I feel very bullish about the future around what's going to happen in the economy in, in the next, um, you know, 15 months, say. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about, um, you know, what's happening with the vaccine, with understanding more about the virus, how we can keep ourselves safe and healthy um, throughout this process. And, and it's not, I won't say normal, but just evolve to doing things that humans like to do, which is being with each other in person, traveling, um, you know, eating out or engaging in, you know, fun social activities and stuff like that. So, Matt, you said that, uh, this last 12 months has been uh, the most or one of the most challenging years of, of your life. Uh, and I also know from your intake form that you and your wife like to travel. So maybe you're, you're, you're due for a vacation. So if, if you could travel anywhere here in the next couple of months, where would you guys go? Well, our favorite uh, vacation spot is the Oregon coast. So every year we go there. So we didn't go last year. I don't know if we'll make it this year. So that's one place I want to go internationally. I like to go to Japan fascinated with that culture. So I'd like to, to go there. Um, so, yeah. Very cool. Well, Ryan, uh, before I kind of close it out here, do you have any, uh, any closing uh, questions or comments for, for Matt? Not closing questions. I think I'm struck, and I and I should have known some of this myself because I do know some of the story. But I, I think how apropos of an analogy of the buffalo running into the storm as a description yeah. of of the last year. Um, and and the skies aren't completely clear yet, but um, but I think the buffalo's through the worst of it. And and just you know, congratulations for <laughs> for what you guys have, have been able to put together thus far. And and I do think some great lessons for for other business owners out there to take away from. So really really appreciate hearing the story. Yeah, well said. Well said, man. Appreciate it. Well, Ryan, thank you for uh, joining as co-host today and for uh, making the introduction to Matt. Uh, Matt, uh, that was a just a phenomenal, uh, really enlightening conversation. So, Matt, thank you for joining us today. But before we close things out, uh, for anybody that might want to get in touch with you, uh, you know, individually or with uh, Sportique as a, as a, as a company, um, what's the best way for people to go about doing that? Yeah, so best way is to visit us at sportique.com, S-P-O-R-T-I-Q-E.com, so there's no U after the Q. Uh, if, if you're a business looking for some cool, comfortable uh, apparel for your business, uh, sportiquewholesale.com uh, is, a, is a great place to, to go for, for that. And um, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram um, as well. Cool. Well, I know you're on LinkedIn because I just sent you a, a connection request so they could find you there too. And LinkedIn, correct. Fantastic. Well, Matt, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and for uh, sharing your really, really cool story. Well, thank you very much, Landon and Ryan. I appreciate, 
uh, the opportunity to talk about it and have the platform to do so. Absolutely, our pleasure. And we look, we look forward to following your success. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.